Welcome to Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. And our show is all about two professors of hospitality management, uh, Dr. Thomas Peacock, who is not here, and myself, Dr. Lonnie Wright. Uh, we have taught hospitality for domestic and international uh, students. We have taught abroad, me uh, in Singapore, and the same with uh, Dr. Peacock. And what we're trying to do is to introduce Las Vegas from an academic point of view, from, from a point of view that is a little different from the sensationalism that you get uh, about Las Vegas, some stereotypes. Um, but we want to let you know about those individuals that made this town what it is today as either uh, change agents, as individuals that were innovative, creative, individuals that made a difference in the history of this town. Today we have, I, I, I would say a young man because we go all the way back 50 years. <laughs> and I don't want to say an old friend of mine, but um, Mr. Dan Napier, who, um, without any doubt, I, I was born and raised here in Vegas. I know of no African American that has risen to the heights of Mr. Dan Napier and also his brother, Dana Napier, who was the vice president of uh, pending opening of gaming in Detroit. Two outstanding brothers, but I, I, I think I got the the, the brother now, Dana, don't get mad at me. The, the brother that, uh, that really, really made some waves as well as Dana did, but, but uh, did some things that um, no African-American has done in this city's history. And, and I, I like to say that uh, when you can have the gravitas to be able to bring the three mics to your property, and we'll talk about the three mics. Uh, I'm gonna let you think about who are the three mics, and you're gonna be amazed at uh, the relationship that Mr. Dana Napier had with the three mics. I won't give last names right now. But I, I, I wanna say to the audience that we as African Americans, years ago we met, um, uh, one heck of a basketball player. I thought he'd be a starting guard for the running Rebels. He'll tell you what happened there. It wasn't because he wasn't good enough. He made a choice, and we'll, we'll talk about that choice. Uh, Dana, um, when when we were we, we first met, it was, I mean, Dana, Dan. See, I get the <laughs> twins mixed up. He, he's looking over at me and saying, hey, hold it, man. Dan, not Dana. So Dan, when we first met, funny story, I used to think that Dan and Dana was the same person because when I the first time I met Dan, I met him in the morning time. Just a lovely individual man. We lived in the same uh, housing uh, complex and and um, and I met him for the first time and I was so impressed by the way he conducted himself, he was so articulate and all of these things. And I said, well, I got to get to know this guy. So now later on that day, I'm coming back to my housing and, and I run into him again. Only this time he was dressed to the nines and, and, and I said, hey man, how you doing? I said, uh, man, you, you really uh, uh, change your clothes so quick. He said, Man, you probably met my twin brother. <laughs> and so that's how I met the, the Napier twins, just two uh, extraordinary individuals that, that um, understood hospitality um, in and out, uh, whether it's in the gaming side or the hotel side. So without any further ado, I want to introduce to our audience Mr. Dan Napier. And my first question to you, is how has Las Vegas from the very beginning, and take your time, 
from the very beginning of you being a part of this and also encompass why you didn't play, play for the rebels and why you chose what you chose. So, Mr. Napier. Lonnie, thank you very much, Sid. And I'm calling you Lonnie because of this 50 years of friendship. So right. Exactly. I've got to remember to call you Dr. Wright. But thank you so much for those wonderful compliments that you extended not only to me, but to my brother. It's, it's, I, I really appreciate it. Um, and just as wonderful as it was meeting you for the first time, the feelings are mutual. Um, you know, it, it's been an interesting run in life. Uh, I, I attribute uh, my, any of my success really to my, my, my grandfather, who was a farmer, and he owned two mortuaries, and he had some interest in a convalescent home in a small town in Seguin, Texas. And to my mother, his, his daughter, uh, my grandfather was in the service industry, because when you're in the mortuary business or you're in the convalescent business, assisted living, you uh, 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 have a deep concern for people. You know, and I, I think, uh, and he was a very religious man, so was my mother. We were in church, Sunday school every Sunday. And I think what it did, it helped formulate this idea of, of helping people. And I think it, it transferred to many aspects of our life as we, as we got older. You know, my mother remarried when I was uh, 16 years old. We moved from Austin, Texas to Denver, Colorado. And that, that we went from a liberal city, Austin, Texas, which is conservative to most people, but for Texas, it was considered liberal, to an ultra-liberal city. Um, I went to an all African-American elementary school. I never went to school with anybody of a different race until I got in the seventh grade. And fortunately for us, I, my, my mother and my grandfather, they never taught us any differences between people. They always um, instilled in us that the, the, the ability to respect people. When we moved to Denver, I, I met some guys that were just, they, 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 they're my best friends in the whole world along with Oris Wynn back in Austin, Texas. But th they were totally different. You know, the atmosphere was totally different. There was much more freedom. As a matter of fact, it w we went to a great high school, East High School. Hattie McDaniels graduated from there. Pam Greer lived in Denver. We lived a couple of homes from Sonny Liston. Joe Lewis lived uh, right up the street from us. Um, three of the founding members, uh, Andrew Wolfrook, who just pa who recently passed away, uh, he went to school with us. Philip Bailey, lead singer in Earth, Wind & Fire, one of the lead singers on Maurice White, and Larry Dunn. So it, um, the basketball team that I, that I played on, we won the state championship. Our, our, uh, my teammate, Rudy Carey, became the winningest coach in Colorado basketball history. So I think all of those things helped to formulate who I was becoming as an individual. And I have to think people like you, uh, when I came out, I was, I was playing basketball at Purdue and I got red shirted. And my mother took away our car. And Pur Purdue was an isolated place, but Houston was 45 miles away. So we always wanted to go to Houston and have a little fun, but my mother took the car away because she thought we were having too much fun. So Anna and Ann lived in Las Vegas and we came out here. Now, I think Coach, I used to get letters from Coach Blip not when he was at uh, Pepperdine, I think before he came to UNLV and then Long Beach State, or is it? Well, anyway, so when I got out here, I was, I got a summer job, but I would go to the gym just to keep in shape. And I was playing against these guys. I didn't know they played for UNLV. And, and you were killing them. <laughs> well, I, I did all right. Say, right, say, right. And the next thing I know, Tony Morocco, Target's assistant and chief recruiter, started recruiting me. And he, I, I said, you know what, I really want to go to law school. He said, don't you worry about a thing. We don't have a law school. I said, well, you know, well, I could be. That'll make me all yours. And I was working at the Sands Hotel. But first, I was a dishwasher there because I just got it for a summer job. But every day, I'd look up on the, the bulletin boards. And while I was washing dishes, I took some summer classes, right? And I would, I would be, on my break, I would sit down 
in the dishwashing room. All of a sudden, Sammy Davis Jr. walked by. He said, hey, young blood. And he saw me studying. And he said, come with me. And he took this chair. He sat it on the side of the stage. And I sat there and I watched. I watched the show. So then he took me now. I'm only 19 years old. He took me backstage. And they had those house phones in the dressing room. Long distance, can you dial? I called my parents. I can't believe it. I'm in Sammy Davis Jr.'s dressing room. And lo and behold, uh, Lucille Ball walks in. I just hung the phone up and said, I love Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> and she walked over to me and she kissed me on the cheek and she said, I love you too, like that. And I was totally starstruck. Yes, yeah, just mesmerized. Then Billy Eckstein came in, and I can remember my, 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 my stepfather was a jazz musician. Of course, we'd listen to Billy Eckstein, oh, 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 you know, at mm. home. And all of these entertainers, they would come through the kitchen area. And so I got to see, meet Lena Horne and all of these people. So after- That's Vintage after, Vegas. Yes, it is Vintage Vegas. Vegas. Right. But what it did was all of a sudden it brought a calmness about me. I wasn't as starstruck anymore because I had met so many people, you know, people that I just thought I'd never meet in my whole life. So I went and applied for this job at the front desk. And um, Ed Zeich was the hotel manager and he, he said to me, well, what makes you think you can have this job? And I said, well, you know, I used to work at my grandparents' mortuary in the summertime and work on the funerals. And I said, everybody that would come to the funeral home, they were real sad. But I said, everybody that walks through the door to Sands Hotel are real happy. And I said, it's a whole lot easier dealing with people when they're happy than when they're sad. And he said, I like that, you got the job. And so eventually I got one promotion. This is just in the summer, this quick. So school is starting. So I'm trying to get myself in shape. And they call me up to the office, the president of the hotel, Richard Dannon. And he said, Dan, I need to see you in my office. And I look around and I'm scared to death. I don't did know, I do well, wait, what did wrong? I do something wrong? They didn't call my immediate supervisor. This is the president. Of the so I'm walking up to the man, I'm scared to death, Mr. Dannon here. So I walked in. And lo and behold, Mr. Dannon was in there and Michael Callahan. The governor of the, the state governor of Nevada. The governor of the state of Nevada. And uh, they said to me, Dan, uh, I understand you're going to be playing basketball uh, here at UNLV. And we've talked to Coach Stark Kane. He thinks you're a really good player. and uh, But we really think your destiny is working in the gaming industry. You know, there are not hardly any African Americans working here, but we think you have a big future in the industry. We want you to just, you know, we'll give you a day or two to think about it, but we want you to forget about basketball and concentrate. He said, you know, your chances of making it to become a professional basketball player are pretty slim, but the odds of you making it in the industry are much better. And that's when I made that decision, Lonnie, to focus in on, on my career. And um, I got promoted uh, to assistant hotel manager right away. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. Anytime you have the governor of the state of Nevada yeah. and the president of a yeah. hotel looking and seeing uh, the talent that, that you had at a, at a very impressionable young age, and for them to express that to you, you know, that, that, that was a heck of a decision because we thought we were going to have two twins running the front. <laughs> 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 because when, when we played with you guys, man, uh, Dana and Dan, it was like you guys were telepathic, man. You you guys were throwing Steph Curry passes before we even saw Steph Curry pass. You guys were on the money, man. I'm saying, wow, the Rebels are going to really do great with these twins. Right. However, I didn't know what happened to you until later, maybe uh, in the middle of the semester. You were still going to school. Right. However, you weren't playing ball. And, and uh, you were the epitome, if you would have played, uh, like myself, we had our, our um, 
I guess, student athlete. We always put student first yes, and athlete so. second. Because yeah. I, I think that you coming from the background that you did, your parents and your uh, your family owning businesses, you knew more than just putting your eggs in one basket. So, so now you start off, and they and, and you start at the front desk. Right. How did the, uh, tell me how did you rise all the way up? I know it, it didn't happen overnight, but but some of your moves were really. Uh, um, you know, you got some promotions really quick, and and you were the talk of the town. I mean, I'm when I say the talk of the town, I'm saying it transcend the color of your skin. You were the talk of the town, whether it, it was in uh, an area predominantly black or an area predominantly white. You were an anomaly, and and when people met you, they understood. I mean, that you have a charm about you, man. Every Ever since I met you, that that was kind of like an old spirit, but but was still hip, right. you know. And, and you <laughs> made people you. feel welcome, and 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 you. Ne I never have, for fifty years, ever hear you say a curse word, unless you were emphasizing something someone else said. Yeah. So so I knew that your your intelligence uh, uh, and your your intelligent quotient and and um, your ability to to uh, communicate to all people across all different uh, genres or whether uh, ethnicities was something that was was a gift, man. It was a gift. Well, thank you, uh, Lonnie. I think part of it was a gift, but the other part of it is I think uh, the environment that you grow up in is is really crucial to a person's success. You know. I like to think I had good parenting. Growing up and, and working in, in that mortuary and working in that convalescent home, see, there's not a lot of difference between a, an assisted living place and a hotel. The only difference is, are the residents. Most of the residents in assisted living are incapacitated in some way or another, whereas people in hotel who come to stay at a hotel are very active, but operating those two structures are generally the same because both are really hotels. So I, I caught, all I had to do was learn what their system was. Now I didn't know, of course I didn't know everything, but we, we had a laundry at the, at the convalescent home, but we took the clothes and put them in the washer and dryer. But there was a huge laundry system because you're doing so much laundry. You know, you're doing it for the restaurants. We had a small restaurant, a kitchen in our in the convalescent home. You know that, and it was owned first by my step grandmother. My actual grandmother died, uh, God rest her soul, uh, when I was nine months old. And my grandfather remarried, and that's how all of that the funeral home and the convalescent home started. But that made the transition. I mean, it made me catch on to a lot of things. So, at a young age, you know, I look back at it now, and I said. You know, I'm sitting up here 23 years old and I'm managing people that are 40 and 50 years old. And I, sometimes I would wonder when I would get that resentment if it, whether it was the fact that I was young or whether it was the fact I was an African-American because literally in almost every job I had, I was always the first. Mm -hmm. During those times of, of, of going to college with different different ethnic groups, all of those things, they help make you who you are. But I always went to a lot of sporting events because I did miss playing basketball. And I would go to boxing events. You know, They were held at the Silver Slipper. Remember the old uh, Coliseum they had behind the behind Caesar's Palace? Right. What was it called? The, uh, the, well, they called it the, the home of the champions. champions. That's right. what they called it. Right, but it only held 6,000 people, Right, if you recall. Right. That's the same as the convention center right. did for basketball. But I would always go to those events, and I remember the first time. Harry Goodhart, he, he was a casino manager. Back then, the casino manager was all seeing, Everybody. all knowing every, everything. He was, he, was He's in charge. he was the man. He was the man. So he gave me um, a ticket to go see my, my first fight, I think. That might have been my second fight, but I sat on the front row. And I'm sitting down, I'm there early because I'm excited and I'm looking around. I saw Clint Eastwood over there. And then all of a sudden, 
Sugar Ray Robinson comes and sits right beside of me. Now my two uncles, my mother's brothers, they were big fans of Joe Lewis and uh, Sugar Ray Rob, uh, Joe Lewis and Sugar Ray Robinson. And here I am sitting next to Sugar Ray Robinson. Then Cary Grant comes over. And sits he, on the other he side. Sits on the other side. So I'm in between. You on Gucci guys. Roll, man? I can't believe it. <laughs> so I had him sign my uh, program, and then Don King comes over and asked Don to sign it. He was so happy, but. These people were coming up at that time. They could just walk up to people back in those days, if you remember. Yeah. They asked Sugar Ray for his autograph, and then they asked me for my. I said, No, no, you don't want my autograph, no. nobody. I said, <laughs> the guy said, Don't be an asshole. Sign the program. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just scribbled, Sign, my, I just scribbled my name, right? right. right. <laughs> and then they asked Cary Grant. And he thought it was really hilarious. You know, he thought it was a nice looking guy, by the way. Yeah, real smooth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. That those was you know that was in the early stages of my career, and uh, I, I did I always felt that I, I never forgot what Governor Callahan said and uh, Mr. Vanner said you know when when you're always a first back in those days you really had a a responsibility to try to give it your very best effort your very best mm -hmm. and what I noticed as I was progressing. There weren't, there weren't a lot of African-American people. There weren't a lot of people of color that would come into the casinos. But whenever I saw someone, you know what I would do? I would walk up to them. I would say, how would you like some dinner? <laughs> and I'd just buy, buy them dinner because I saw African-American people gambling. And all of these pit bosses and stuff, they basically ignored them. They gave them nothing for their buck. And I think it was their way of saying, well, we really don't want you here. And if we start comping you. We can't get rid of you. We can't get rid of you. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I saw that. So did my brother. We would talk about that. And we would always uh, solicit that. And one of the, one of the uh, couples, there was this beautiful couple also. I'll never forget them. Elmer and Frankie Jones. They were from Virginia. And I took them to dinner and I sat down and I found out that he was a Tuskegee Airman. Wow. Fought in World War II. And and, and um, we stayed friends for many years. And as a matter of fact, when uh, I became vice president of, of FGM Marketing, I invited the entire Tuskegee Airmen. Airmen. It was about 15 of them. That, that particular squadron and the ones that were alive, I invited them all out. And they were my guests. I mean, I paid for it because they were true American heroes. And and I, I didn't think they ever got the love, but I felt that there was a duty that I had to do that because if, if I could make it, you know, I, I wanted to try to help other people make it. Well, you know, you, just being who you are is the reason why uh, you receive so much reciprocity because now I'm going I'm to jump really ahead of the – the three M's. Okay. I mean, you ingratiated this couple. Uh, and he happened to be a, a Tuskegee Airman. You ingratiated just different people. That's one thing about the magic of hospitality. You're you're just maybe one or two people away from a lot of greatness. Yes. And so now, fast forward to the three M's. Can you share with the audience the three M's and who? were the three M's and how you invited them to the MGM? The three M's were Mike Tyson, Michael Jordan, and Michael Jackson. Uh, the first the first of those three M's I met was Michael Jackson. My brother and I went to see the Jackson Five at, at the at the old MGM, at the old MGM, right. which is now Ballet. Ballet. And we were, you know, that was my that was our favorite group at that time. We sat on the front row. Mine and, too. And yeah, I want man, you I back think I off. I can sing like Mike. Man. No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, well, we we were sitting on the front row, and they were like talking to us during the performance. Meet us backstage. So we went backstage, and we hung out with Jackie. Jackie did most of the talking, right? And Michael was real shy. Tito and. And, and Jermaine were really cool, you know, Marlon and, and Michael were still young. Janet was just a baby, but she had performed, but she, was, uh, she wasn't she was there. So they wanted to go play. He said, you look like you play basketball. 
That's what Jackie said. Yeah. I said, what? Well, that's your well, yeah. spot. Yeah, right. I said, do y'all want to go play? You he schooled said, the Jackson he Five. He said, yeah. So we said we were going to play play the next day. We got a call from Joe Jackson and told him he didn't know us, so the boys couldn't come play basketball with us. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? Now that I look back at that. That was the right thing. Right. To do, huh? Now, let's go to Mike, Mike Tyson. All throughout my career, I always went to sporting events, and they held the Olympic trials here. And that's where I met Mike. I also met Ivan, the whole boxing team. I was just, back in those days, you could walk, literally walk into the arena and watch these guys training, and then they'd have the qualifying matches. And that's where I met Mike. And Mike got beat by Henry Tillman. You know why I think he, he, Henry Tillman beat him? Because Henry was a boxer, Mike was a slugger, and Henry was accumulating punches, but they had on headgear. Mm -hmm. So when Mike hit him, it just... It didn't hurt him. It didn't hurt him. Uh -huh. You know, had they gone without headgear, I think Mike would have knocked him out and would have represented the United States. Mm -hmm. It would have made Mike even more famous than what he is had he won that gold medal. So that's how I met Mike. Now, Michael Jordan, Lonnie... You had started the alum, UNLV Alumni Association, and we were sitting up one day. We were talking. We were talking about who could we bring, bring to the next, to alumni, the next game. alumni game. Right. We came Michael Jordan. Right. Right. And you went. North Carolina. In North Carolina. North Carolina against UCLA. I said, wait a minute. They got McAdoo, Bobby Jones, they, the Charlie Scott, Phil Ford. And I said, plus, that'd be a, kind of like a rematch of the 77 championship. Right. You know, and now all of a sudden all my marketing skills are coming oh, together yeah. along oh, with yours. Oh, oh. And uh, you went to Chicago and met with Michael and, and, and closed a deal. And um, by the way, to this day, when we play golf, he always asks about you. Did you know that? That's a lot of So when Michael. But he met Steve Wynn, he didn't need to call me. <laughs> <laughs> so you really came and stayed at the Golden Nugget. Right. So, right. so we were sitting up talking one day. and. I, uh, I've always loved clothes. And uh, I, I found back in the 70s, there was this really young designer. I, I kept up because I always got GQ magazines. It was Giorgio Armani. So I was wearing Giorgio Armani suits when people didn't know who George, Giorgio Armani was. By the way, my daughter shares that same love of fashion. And that's the reason why I didn't wear a suit, because I knew you would wear it. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like my partner, Har right. Harold Lewis. Right. Man, you don't want to try to dress, out dress this guy. <laughs> so we, as a matter of fact, got on Giorgio Armani suit right I see, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Giorgio should pay us. But we, uh, so so Michael, he came up to hey, man, where'd you get those suits? Where'd you get that suit? So I told him where I got a suit, but Michael, you He know, was kind of like a... He, he was a country guy. Uh, He's just I a country him, boy. He was real a nice country. guy. Country nice guy, guy, but real country. Yeah. You know? And, of course, I had something in common. I'm a country You're boy. Not country basically. anymore. He's right. very sophisticated. You're right. He's very sophisticated. So I told him, I said, look, man, you don't you don't go in. You, you still going in store? Yeah. I said, no, man. You go find you a tailor. And if you like this suit and you can remember how it looks, then you have your tailor design it, you know, and have it fitted. And, you know, he, I couldn't believe it. All that money he was making, yeah. he was still buying suits yeah. off the racks. But that, that speaks to the naivety of a lot of pro athletes yes. that, that go right. from rags to riches, right. man. And if they don't have the right people around them, right. you know, you know, sometimes they, they make they may make the wrong right. decisions, you know. Right. But but in Mike's case he became a brand. Yes, he did. Yeah, he yeah. did. I, I, I want to, be, before you say that about, I want you to talk to our audience about how you brought Mike Tyson okay. literally out of prison yes. on a private jet. So now, I want you to continue on and, and, and share with our audience how you physically went to pick up Mike, how you convinced uh, the MGM that you could change the course of boxing yes. at, through a guy named Mike Tyson. So if you can pick that up. We opened the, uh, as a, as a co the company opened the MGM in December of 1993. Uh, uh, when I uh, 
resigned from the Mirage to accept the MGM job. I wasn't supposed to start until December. And I took off in September uh, so that I could have a few months just to relax, maybe spend with my kids. And uh, I, I called uh, the president of the mortgage division. I said, the people are calling, looking for me. I think you might want to start me a little early. He said, well, come on in. We'll start in October the 1st. So um, I was learning the ropes about being a marketing executive. I had held just about every position you could hold in a hotel except for working in marketing, which is a key to any organization, exactly. you know. And uh, they had this Wizard of Oz thing. So when we opened the casino, um, I remember they had me on a shift from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. In the, in the afternoon, well, I would come in at seven o'clock, and I remember a guy that used to, he, he was my supervisor, he would teach, what are you doing in here so early? You think you're gonna get somewhere like that? And I, but I was just, I'd never really, I hadn't worked on a clock in quite some time. And so, I mean, if you have a job to do, you do the job till it's done. Right. And, and, and growing up, my, my parents and grandparents always said, start early, end late, you'll get the job done. And uh, I would stay there, Lonnie, until, Dr. Wright, until 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And what I noticed was, man, I could, you know when a casino opens, how crowded it is. But I would walk to the casino, and, and, and at 11 o'clock at night, these kids would be everywhere. They were baby carriages, children crying and carrying on. and You just couldn't get through it. It was a maze of kids. And... So I went up and I talked to the, the president of the company and, and one of the guys on the board of directors, and, and I said, you know, I just want to tell you my findings, what I think. Now, this is a lowly marketing representative. I'm in basically at the bottom of the totem pole. And I said, as I walk around, I see all these kids here, and I don't know if this Dorothy, the Wizard of Oz thing, is, is, is going to work. I said, People, when, when people come to Las Vegas, they want to have fun. I said, but when, when with their kids, they take their kids to Disneyland. But Las Vegas is an adult Disneyland. It's really a town for adults. And uh, I said, it's running off some of the customers rather than bringing in people. Yeah, you're bringing in a lot of kids and families, but they can't go to the clubs. They can't go in the casino and gamble. I said, I see kids hanging around the tables and that's against the law to have someone at a gaming table. Did they, hear you, beside, did they hear you, Dan? I don't think so. I think they were letting it go in one ear and out the other. Now, all of a sudden, right after opening, the profits are down. You know, usually when the casino opens, the profits are skyrocketing. Right. They weren't making, they had to make a million dollars over a million dollars a day. Well, they made it, but not much of a profit. Now, at that time, I didn't have privy to the figures, but I could tell you could you could see pressure mm -hmm. on people's faces, the way they act, the way they manage when they have pressure on them, and I felt that pressure. So we had another meeting, and I said, you know what? Why don't we try? We should try to do. We should, what we should try to do is is make the MGM the mecca of boxing. We should take boxing away from Caesar's Palace. So these same two guys said to me, well, how can we do that, Dan? I said, well, we should sign Mike Tyson. He's going to be getting out of prison here in about 30, 45 days. Oh, that guy is a... They looked at each other in surprise, you know. They looked, and, and then they looked back at, well, how are we going to do that? The guy, you know, he has a bad reputation. He went on a freak. I said, well, you know, in the African-American community, a lot of us think he was railroaded. And so I said, his skills are so great that people are not going to think about that. He's still going to be the face of the, boxing. He's, he's the guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I said, he's probably the biggest draw since Ali. Mm -hmm. They looked at each other again. So a couple of weeks later, they said, they called me up to the office. And anytime I get called to the office, I, I don't think it's for the good. <laughs> hey, Dan, you know, uh, when you were talking to us a couple of weeks ago about that, uh, I think we're going to do that deal. I said, what? He said, oh, yeah. 
we have a contract here. Okay, we've written up for him with our attorneys. And Kirk Kerkorian is giving you his jet. He wants you to fly to Cleveland and then talk to Don, get Don, get Don and Michael to come back here. If you can't, get them to sign the contract on the plane. <laughs> and I said, okay. And then they said, and by the way, here's a $5 million cashier check. You give that to them at, at signing. Now, don't give it to them if they, they don't sign. sign. <laughs> so I got to the airport, got a hold of Don. Don said, we're coming to you. We're coming to the airport. I said, okay. So I waited for a couple of hours. Do you remember the movie Coming to America? You remember when right, all the right. limos were pulling up with all the suitcases? Uh -huh, right, That's right. exactly the way. I saw all these suitcases, these these limos coming down the tarmac with all these. It must have been a hundred thousand dollars, maybe, maybe. Anyway, a hundred thousand and a half million dollars worth of Louis Vuitton luggage. Oh my goodness! That was in those cars. <laughs> Mike comes up and hey, Dan. And I guess he 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 did remember me from the Olympic trials. So uh -huh. we got on the plane and we headed back to Las Vegas. And on the company's plane, private on, jet. On, on Kirk, he had a 737 that was customized. Oh, boy. It was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> By the way, on the way up there, the uh, flight attendant said to me, Mr. Nippy, what would you like? And I, I was testing him, right? Is that about some crepes? No problem. <laughs> so they, <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, well, you know, it's a three and a half hour flight. Uh, if you like to go take a nap and then you can shower, change clothes. I said, oh, that'd be a good idea. So I went and just messed up the bed and then got in the shower to see if it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was working. But once Mike got on the plane, we just talked a little bit. I met his fiance. And by the way, the the uh, young lady is uh, was a lieutenant. Her brother was a lieutenant governor of uh, Maryland. He became a, a, actually, I think, head of the Republican Party. National Committee. Are you you know what I'm talking Steele? about? Steele? Yes, yes. Michael Steele. Yes. Yeah, right. Wow. It's, that's how small the world it is. Yes. So uh, while we're sitting down, Michael, we, we, you know, he had John Horn, Rory Holloway, yeah. Don with him. And some other guys, Crocodile, they were right. all there. Right. So I thought I was just picking up four guys. Well, I ended up picking up about 10 people. So now the chef's got to fix everything for, for 10 people. So while they're cooking, Mike, he's staring at me. You know, now you got to remember, he's been incarcerated. So I'm looking at him. What can he do to me at 35,000 feet, right? So <laughs> he looked at me and he said, you know what, Dan? Where did I remember you from? I said, uh, the Olympic trials. No, it wasn't the Olympic trials. I said, well, where was it? He said, I think we dated the same woman. I said, Mike, we have never, ever dated the same woman. Oh. Now I realize I don't want any problems with him at 35,000 feet. So we, so we had a big laugh about that. So after we kind of laughed and everything chilled out a little bit, I took him back took Rory, John, and Don to the back room, and I, and I had them sign the contract. And then I handed them a million dollars, uh, the $5 million cashier's check. We landed in Las Vegas, man, and as soon as I, we got off the plane, my phone was ringing. Man. I asked, hello, this is such and such from Sports Illustrated. This, can't talk, sorry. This is such and such from Time Magazine. How these people got my phone number, I have no idea, but my phone was continuously ringing. There were paparazzi at the hangar when we landed, then we went to the hotel, put Mike in his suite. He called me and said, Dan, I need to see, I need to see you. I came, he said, I need a million dollars. Hmm. So well, I, you just gave him five million. I just gave him a five million dollars. Yeah, sure, check. A right. million dollars. So I called the cage. We got a million dollars. Yeah, Dan, we got it. So I said, okay, I need you to endorse this, this cashier's check, and then I'll write another one for you for four million. So Crocodile comes down with a gym bag. He puts a million dollars in cash in the gym bag. He goes up to the suite. Mike said, Dan, I want a Rolls Royce. I want a Rolls Royce. Like that, you know, in his bliss New York accent. I said, okay. So I called, uh, was it Tony Trudnick? No, who was, the, who was the BMW guy up on the corner? You remember? Uh, you know I, what I'm talking about. Yes. So I called him. 
He opened up the dealership, and I kid you not, Mike walked, he had a million dollars. First of all, we went to Caesar's Palace, and I called my brother, who, who was a sister casino manager there, pit manager. He called the people at Versace. I said, Mike is coming over here from Versace, so you, you got to shut the Versace. You need to talk to somebody and shut the Versace store down. Now, that's the aspect of having a family member that you're close to that can help you get things done, mm -hmm. teamwork. So he did that within... I'm talking about it was a free for all in there between Mike, Rory, and John in the Versace store. They seventy five thousand was gone just like that. And you know, in nineteen ninety four, that was, was a, a lot, lot of money. money. That's a lot of money. So yeah. then we went over to the Rolls Royce dealership, and as soon as Mike walked through the door, I want that car. I gotta have that car. And so then he said, "Give me four of them." And Don, Rory, and John they picked their colors. And by then, man, a lot of it was it was almost gone. It was it was just unbelievable. But 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 in a in a way, because he spent you okay. In a way, you they they spent the money so fast that they had to have signed for more fights. Yes. So that well, was the contract, problem. but the contract was a five. Five six fight deal for two hundred million dollars, and uh, I'm going to skip skip a little bit of that to say that Mike Tyson is one of the nicest and most generous human beings I've ever met. He was really really nice to me and kind. And I still to this day consider him a friend. But he, he, you know, when you grow up like he grew up, of course you have all these insecurities and and uh, different traumas. Uh, different traumas in your life. And 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 because his life is put on the front page of everything, it's very difficult. Any mistake that he makes is magnified. Yes. And to have the fame and the fortune that he had and that he now has, it it, it doesn't. It's not an easy life. Mm -hmm. But as we got to know each other a little bit better, that's when I saw his kindness. I mean, he didn't have to do that for his friends. John and Rory grew up with him, and he took care of them. And I think it was an admirable thing to do. It might not necessarily have been the smartest thing, but it was an admirable thing mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how, so, as you know, now after Mike, now it's Michael. And Michael's thing was- Jordan or? Yeah, Jordan. Okay. After George, you, you know, what really solidified this relationship wasn't the clothes, but it was golf. And I won't tell you how much we would bet, but I mean, Michael likes to make people bet things that make them uncomfortable. Uh, Let's say if I lose. That'll throw your game off on me. That's exactly right. <laughs> so that's his whole stick, right? Right. 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 And um, I can remember, I'll tell you a story of. Michael came in and, and I picked him up at the airport. It was on, it'd be, it was the draft was coming up, and we drove out to Shadow Creek. Michael said, "I'm not taking any calls." You know, I already told him who I want. I'm not taking any calls. And he got on the phone. Look, I don't, I'm gonna be. In, I'm in Las Vegas. I don't want to be bothered. I'm gonna be out here for like seven, eight days. I don't want no telephone calls. He hung up and said, "Hey, man, look, let me explain something to you." I said, you're president of the Wizards now. I said, you got a job just like I do. You have to take calls. Mm -hmm. That day of no taking, I said, when you were playing, you didn't have to take calls, but you're the president of an organization. That's right. You got to take calls. So he said to me, I said, well, who are you going to draft? He said, Kwame Brown, best player in the draft. I said, Kwame Brown, I never heard of him. He's a hot schooler, best player in the draft. I said, Still never heard of him. I go to all the AAU games. You're going to hear of him. I said, well, what about Shane Battier? You know what he said to me? I ain't drafting no dookie. <laughs> <laughs> so he was holding grudges. Right, he's holding from grudges. Back in college. Right, from back in college. You know what I'm saying? Michael, you're the, you're the president. You got to... You got to overlook what college these right, guys right, are right. going to. You well, can't he was have loyal to, to North Carolina. Yes, he was loyal yeah. to North Carolina. To a fault. Didn't Duke try to get him 
uh, try to recruit him as well? I'm not you sure. You know, his story to me, he told me that he really wanted to go to UCLA. That's what he told me. You know, it may hold all of this, some of this stuff out for, you know. But he uh, he told me that he really wanted to go to UCLA. But well, UC, they had but won UC, all those championships. Yes, but, but UCLA didn't recruit him. Wow. He said that's the only reason. He said if they would have, that's what he told me, if UCLA would have recruited, recruited him. him. He would have gone to UCLA. Wow. It's been a wonderful, wonderful friendship. We we've had so many great times on the golf course. When I think you that's... when you were uh, helpful in getting Mike, you know, we had already played the Greyhound, the, the Running Rebels. Right. Had already played in the alumni game. Yes. And 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 then we got Mike to to come out and and you guys set all that up for me right. to go down there and meet him. When Mike got here and I picked him up at the airport he um, was he wanted to go to Shadows Creek yes I think I was the first one to take him take him there I had to call Steve, Steve. Wynn and Steve Wynn took care of everything and I'm saying that to say this about Mike's co comp competitive nature yes so Mike was we, we had a shoot around before the alumni game and Mike was supposed to do nine holes and I think he did 18. So I went to, to all the rebel ball uh, guys that was going to guard that. Mike. Remember that? I, remember that. I went and I went to all of them, Freddie Banks, Reggie Thiers, uh, yeah. um, Mike, uh, uh, you know, uh, Robert Smith, anybody that was going to have him. to guard Mike that night. I say, man, Get in his jock band. He gotta be tired. It was about a hundred and something degrees while he was playing. He yeah. he did eighteen holes. I said, man, he's gotta be tired. They upset Mike so much he went for forty six that night. Right. <laughs> he went for forty six, man. When he found out that these guys were really trying to, he thought this is this was just to raise money for us, and that you know he was gonna play right. good. But but when they got into his competitive nature, I right. saw him change, man. I saw him change. But if you could, I don't know if you remember this. There were two things that happened that night. Before the game, he wanted everybody to wear the powder blue Nike Air Jordans, and everybody didn't have them. So he called Nike, and they shipped those things down here. For Perkins and everybody. Well, everybody in a couple hours. you remember that? Right. And, and then the other thing, I think you guys got mad at me because – I told him, hey, man, you going to dunk it on him for the crowd? And then he dunked me, he came by, and he gave me a low five. Right, right, and then y'all right. was looking at me, hey, man, hey, man you, what, you, what you do? You you were supposed to be with us, not with him. I said, hey, that's Michael Jordan. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Mike was, he, he is something else. What yeah. what a competitor. And and and, and to your uh your ability to, to, to be able to ingratiate yourself with people like Mike helped a bunch of athletes, uh, you know, we raised a lot of money for a lot of guys to go back to school, man. Yes. And I, I, I've, I've never publicly thanked you for that, and I do today. Thank you because a lot of guys, not only from that game, um, had enough money for the baccalaureate, we started a master's program. No other university has ever done that for, for their student athletes. You know, Lonnie, thank you so much for that compliment. But uh, I, I think people should know just how hard you work, and you came up with this idea to do all of that. And and, and uh, we all owe you a, a debt of gratitude that really we can't be repaid because you have, all from the day I known you, you've always been community minded. You've always been an activist, and you've never been afraid. But I'm going to stop you right there. there because this is about you. Well, thank <laughs> you, but me. I still we have well, to I just wanted credit. to throw that in about yes. Michael and what type of competitor I I witnessed in him and, and, and uh, what you said about Mike Tyson. Now, let's go to Michael Jackson. How did you get Michael to... Uh, Come to the MGM? Yes. I actually... He stayed in the... He called me. Oh. <laughs> Look. Uh, one day, you know, I I uh, spent a lot of time around Jermaine. And next thing you know, Janet calls me and says she's coming in, Janet. So I'm just working, and then I, I started going to walk walk around the casino. So my cell phone rings. Hey, Dan. I said, hello. 
hey, it's Michael. Now, you know, I think somebody's probably playing play right? play, play, play play with me. Uh, I said, hey, Michael, what's up? You know, because I'm baiting them. Nothing much, Dan. I, I really want to come on to the hotel and spend some time over there. I want to take a look at Studio 54. And I'm going to uh, just, uh, you think you can help me with that? And I said, sure. I said, where did you get my number from? He said, Don Barton. So now, I knew he didn't get it from Jermaine. He didn't say he got it from Jermaine or Janet. He got it from Don Barton. So I said, okay, now I know it's real. I said, okay, Michael, what you do is you, you park. I told him, I said, let me talk to the driver. I told him where to park. And man, as I was walking through the casino, it was unbelievable. Bedlam. It was pure bedlam. You needed security. I had security surrounding him and uh, there were people that were trying to get to him. And Mike said, that's okay, let, 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 let that person in, let that person in, we walk. So we went to the Studio 54. Now this is four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, let's go to Studio 54. I said, okay. So we're just sitting up talking about life in itself. It's myself. And actually then Don Barton came over a little later and joined us. And we're sitting and for, in studio. For the audience, Don Barton was the first African-American to own a hotel and here and casino here in Las Vegas. He's a very dear friend of mine. Yes. A very, very close friend. And he's, he's, he's passed, passed away. away. Right. And uh, he took me over to Rita Franklin's house. <laughs> you know, they were neighbors. She liked to cook. But let's get back to Michael. Right. So, <laughs> so Michael, Michael, um, Michael, we were sitting up in Studio 54. He says, hey, Dan, uh, can you get the music on? I said, well, I got to call the engineer. And so I called the engineer. He said, yeah, Dan, I can be over there right away. I got to, can I meet him? I said, sure. So the engineer came over and met him. He said, just put, he said, what would you like to hear, Michael? He said, anything. So the engineer started putting on all of Michael's greatest hits. And man, look at let me tell you something. For about 10 minutes, and 10 minutes is a long time, Michael got up and started singing and dancing to his own music. I had, Lonnie, I had my first, I had a private Michael Jackson concert, and it was just unbelievable. Reciprocity. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, these were my favorite entertainers growing up as a kid. It's and, amazing. And here I am, it's just uh, the three of us, the engineer, and he's just, just singing I, I, and dancing. I want to ask you this question. All of the things that you have done the, the the head guy at at, at um, Terry Lanning. Yes. What was your relationship with Terry Lanning, especially after you were able to change that fight game and all that? What? How did they? Did, you want to tell you about that? The, um, once the company signed Mike Tyson, Kirk Corian made wholesale changes and brought Terry Lanning. And, uh, you know, I had become pretty successful, but I never got promoted or through all of that. I never got promoted. I never got a pay raise. I mean, in the beginning, I made, I think, 42 5 a year. Yeah. And, you, and you're getting people to sign million-dollar right, contracts. Right, right. And, and uh, after you got it done, nobody gave you a raise? or No, not at all. So I, uh, you know, that was just a subliminal things. I think those people were envious. They were extremely envious. Like, where did this guy come from? They really didn't know anything about me. They, I think they didn't, when I got hired, they didn't have any African Americans. So they figured, okay, this guy can talk. He, has a fairly decent appearance. He wouldn't embarrass. I don't think he would embarrass us. He's not a threat to. He's not a threat to us. He's right. Not, right. But once I got in, and the doors of opportunity, and and when opportunity meets skill or whatever, it just rises. Right. The cream is going to rise. Right. And as I started coming up with all these ideas, and I've been creative all my life. But, you're a great artist, man. You can well, thank draw. You, you can. All, all, well, well, you have a you. lot of. You're multifaceted, man. Thank you. Um, but once I did that, Lonnie, 
then came the envy and the bigotry, you know. And but uh that's something we've always faced throughout the industry, you mm -hmm. know, and once Las Vegas was once called the Mississippi of the West. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the to the story, once I started what I did was there are two other African American executives that were working in marketing at major hotels. But they, I think they ran from the African American community, whereas I embraced the African American community. And it helped to change everything from uh, how we did things to how we, uh, the entertainment that we brought in. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Which, which was a part of that evolution. That was part of that evolution. They saw the credence in, in, in what African American right. Right. Uh, athletes, yes, all of that could 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 have an economic impact on a property. No question about it. Be prior to, and and I can't. I'm I'm not here to take credit for all of these changes. But what I can say is, prior to uh, rising to the level that I did, the casinos would only bring in African American entertainers that white audiences. Like, were comfortable with, with and that they embraced, not what the African American community, or for that much that matter, people of color. So I was always trying to recommend people like, hey, let's have Luther Vandross in here for Valentine's Day. That's all he sings about is love. So why can't we have our customers bring their wives here on Valentine's Day? Let's make Valentine's Day a holiday. You know, a special time for Las mm -hmm. Vegas. Let's let's do that. You can make it pop like New Year's Eve, right? If like you New do Year's it right. Eve, if you do it right. You uh -huh. see what I mean? Those are the ideas that I I tried to implement. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, some of these things made sense. But uh, a lot of times they don't listen to you until your success is, till you have success with it. And then again, at the same time, the guys that were above me were not culturally diverse mm -hmm. and that's where the bigotry and the racism comes mm -hmm. in they mm -hmm. don't have black friends they don't have hispanic friends they're all white guys at the top mm -hmm. and all their friends are white mm -hmm. and they don't get out of that comfort zone and i always said to myself you know at that time i was 50 years old and i went to school with a multitude of of racist creeds and colors. And I said, how can these guys be my age and, and all their friends are only white or all their associates are only white? I mean, I have friends, you know, Casey, you remember Bill with mm -hmm. all of these guys that I went to college with. At UNLV. At UNLV, mm -hmm. Tim Lafferty, all of those guys. Are, they're all I consider friends, dear friends. And, mm -hmm. and so I said, how can I have friends that are of different races, creeds, and colors, and, and they don't. So I think that when, when, when people are like that, they limit themselves, they limit their, their, their creativity, they limit the success of their company because they don't look for the talent in people. Because if you only look for one particular ethnic group to think that only that group has talent or they have managerial skills, or that's the only group that has ideas and that's the only group you're going to listen to, you're missing out mm -hmm. on a lot mm -hmm. of things. In and, if, and in Vegas, you know, it's such a competitive yes. town. 17 of the largest hotels in the world are here. Yes. And, and people are, you know, the different corporations are very competitive. Now, if one corporation understands and be and able to transcend, right. uh, your, your thought pattern about how this could make an economic impact and return business and all of those things, yes. those are the hotels that are going to succeed. And, and, and you were one of those change agents that introduced a lot of this. And now with the hip hop generation, yes. out with the old, the baby boomers, in with the new, the millennials, things have changed to where you were years ahead of the, the you know what the the, the thinking is at, at a corporate level so you introduce so I want to get back did they ever 
uh, uh, did anybody ever embrace you and say, hey, man, you've done such a great deal. Here's a raise. Here's this. Here's that. Who was that individual? I know it had to have been an individual because I, I know you started getting paid. Right. So. Terry Lanny did that. What happened, uh, you know, when I left the Mirage, uh, they were going to give me this marketing job, but for some reason it didn't happen. So that's why I left the Mirage. And, uh, oh, they kept dangling. Right. Okay, I understand the dangling. But they already had a marketing right, I understand executive. That. So that right. was as many as they were going to have yeah. for color. Yeah. So uh, one of Steve's executives came over and told me, hey, look, the company made a mistake. We want you to come back. And uh, that's when I went over. And uh, this was after I got, that was at that time. So Dinah Groves, is no longer here with us. She went and told Terry. Next thing I knew, I was in Terry Landy's office. And uh, from that day on, I developed a, 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 good, a relationship. good relationship with him. And he's the one that promoted me and gave me a raise. I didn't ask for a raise. You know what he told me? He said, what, what, what would it take to keep you here? I said, I'd like my own office. And, and I'd like to uh, have the uh, position that I feel I've earned. And uh, I need my own secretary. So he put his hand. He said, you're my kind of guy. He said, do you know all you asked me were for tools to do the job? You never asked me for money. So since you're not worried about money, I'm not going to worry about money. This is how much you're going to be making. That's wonderful. And I said to myself, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> now, you know something? You and I had a, a conversation today on the way to the studio, and we mentioned how um, there's a property, I don't know if we can mention that property, that gave every one of their employees a raise, man. Right. Not a small raise, $5,000 right. for an employee. Yes. And, and, and I'm saying that was a great investment, man. This, that was a great investment. I, I am the eternal. You were a great investment. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I am the eternal optimist, but when I see companies do that, I, I say something's up <laughs> <laughs> because they just don't. Don't just be they, nice. They're just not nice. Okay, <laughs> you know what I mean. They're trying to get something, or something's getting ready to happen. Only the future will tell if I'm right, right or right, wrong. Right. But my, but my experience Let's hope. tells me. I hope for for all the employees' sake. I think it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. thing. Yes. And it helps you. It helps a lot. It also puts some. Yes. It also puts some pressure on their competitors to do the same right. thing for their employees or something. Yes. Near, especially after uh, COVID nineteen. Right. Uh, this is uh this is the employees market now. Right. You know, people people can go somewhere else. Right. Trying to start this back up to where we were before COVID nineteen, people had a chance to think. Right. Had a chance to receive money from the government sure. and, and and look at their value. Yes. And and now, how do we get the best employees? Right. I think that company, and I, we won't mention the right. name, uh, uh, I think that company may have done something pretty smart. Sure. May I say something about value? And this is something I wanted to talk about that. Sometimes I used to think, uh, I thought about quitting the MGM and trying to be become Michael Floyd's manager because these the the athletes that I brought to the table oh, wow. and 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 the entertainers uh, they really didn't know their value let, 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 let me tell you about it Mike Tyson's impact Mike Tyson should not have just gotten a contract from the MGM to fight but I would try to convince Mike all of these hotels should have come together and paid Mike Tyson because of the economic impact he had on the city. The entire he, city. The entire city. He filled up their casinos. All the high rollers flew in. He filled up the town. The food. Look, do you know them, Jim, when, when they, we ran out of Hennessy? <laughs> <laughs> Hold it now, that's a stereotype, man. Yeah, we ran out of Hennessy. That's okay. a stereotype. Well, we ran out the of Hennessy. Big Hennessy, right? Big Hennessy. <laughs> we ran out of Hennessy. We actually ran out of Hennessy. I kid you not. We ran out. Wow. 
and and, and that's what made me think about. I, you know, my I'm always thinking. Wait a minute, I didn't hear this. Say, are they drinking that much? There's that many people. And when I would when I would leave the hotel, it would take me over almost an hour. I lived in Summerlin, but it would take me almost an hour to get home because of the traffic at two o'clock in the morning. Wow. You know, and I said, okay, this is affecting food sales, liquor sales, concession, merchandising. It affects everything. So when Mike would fight, this is back in the 90s, in the early 90s, he would bring over a billion dollars to town. Economic impact. E economic impact. And that's, and even Floyd had that same type of impact. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Much like Elvis Presley did in the 70s. Mm -hmm. you feel, remember when Elvis was in? Yep. He'd fill up Las Vegas. Yes. The town would be packed. That's right. So when... When, 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 when you find an a entity like that, that. You, have right. to, you have to not, not exploit it, but, 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 but reward it. Reward it, right. Yeah. And, and there's much merit. Now, I do believe in, in rewarding people. And I think the companies that are successful are the ones that reward their employees. And that was one of the things I, I tried to do in my career. And that is reward the people who, who patronize the place that I, I was at. I get called in meetings and say, hey man, you overcomped this guy. I said, well, he doesn't come here one time a year anymore. He comes here three times a year. So why don't you see me at the end of the year? At the end of the year, and let's see where the numbers go. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I truly believe in giving people the best bang for their buck. I don't think there's anyone in life that wants to be taken advantage of, mm -mm. to be used. Uh, so this in this business, this is a unique business. People patronize places where they are treated well, where they're appreciated, where they're appreciated. Mm -hmm. It's unique. It's not like a grocery store, and it's and it's deeper than a concept called customer service. Yes, it is. It's much because deeper. people, you can you can go ahead and train customer service, and people can go through the the motions, but right. people can feel real when good hosp ho hospitality, man. That's right. I want to talk to you about you and your brother ended up on a cover of a magazine. Okay. Can you explain that cover and sure and and and, and I want you to also talk about uh, how you got treated by one of your uh, uh, I guess coworkers after they found out after you took the picture with the okay. people that got excited. Right. <laughs> That's a great story. And uh, it started. When um, Terry had said we're going to be going Terry to, Lanning, Terry Lanning, we we're going to be going to Detroit and try to open up a casino. So immediately my head starts clicking, and uh, I said, I had a meeting with him. You know, we we're on a first name basis, which made me feel very comfortable. I said, Terry, look, you know, I'm vice president here. We're moving into Detroit. You know, it's a predominantly African-American city. And I said, the name Napier is well known there. I said, and we're trying to get our licensing. I said, but, you know, if we could hire our brother, my brother, to run that casino up there, I said, that would make it a whole lot easier for you guys to get that licensing. He said, you think Damon would be willing to join the company, Dan? I said, well, you know, I." For the right price, I'm sure that <laughs> everything's negotiable. You know, and he started laughing just like you did. And he said, I want you to talk to Dana. And then you and then have him, I want to talk to him, then we'll come back. But the job is his if he wants it. Wow. So I said I, I sat down with my brother and I, I told him the uniqueness of all of this and what what, type, what mission we would have. It was that, historical also. I, I, yes, I mentioned that to him, and I told him, you know, there's going to be shots taken because there are people who, who really don't like people who look, at, look like us, and they may feel that we may become too powerful within the company as, as a team. And I or said, that old Jim Crow that old, concept, that, that, that's, that's uppity, it, that. uppity, uppity. Yeah, sure. Oh, too, yeah. And they forgot their place. Yes, they forgot their place. <laughs> so... Um, let me tell you a story about when, and so it happened. And I was playing golf with Earl Graves down in uh, Miami. That's uh, editor of uh, 
Essence. Of uh, Black Enterprise. Oh, Black Enterprise. Black Enterprise. Enterprise. Oh, sorry. And uh, he said, hey, Dan, we want to do a story on you. You know, we think it's great. I said, you know what? I said, you know what would be a greater story? He said, what? I said, my brother's getting ready to be promoted to vice president of casino operations for MGM in Detroit. I said, yeah, I've been uh, on the first African-American vice president of a marketing uh, division, you know, assistant vice president. I said, that's unique in itself. And uh, I said, but to have two people from the same family do it, two African-American men, and I said, being identical twins. He said, that's magnificent. That's a great story. So, <laughs> and that's how you guys that, got that, on that, that That's how cover. we got on. That's how we got Now, on. when you were on the front cover, you became very famous. Yeah, I was, very uh, so. all of your friends, including myself, were so proud of you and Dana. Yeah, thank you. Um, but how were you received by some of your colleagues at, at, the, <laughs> at, the, at the MGM? I mean, one particular, per, uh, you know, there's so many stories, but this one particular time when this African American group, uh, uh, couple, couple, right, saw you and recognized you and said, "Can you take a picture? Can I, you share yes. that?" And 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 we're gonna we're gonna share with our 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 guest, you know, uh, besides uh, saying that uh, uh, Mr. Napier is a change agent, here here is the things that we need to understand in hospitality, that the customer transcends the color of your skin. Yes. The customer transcends your gender. You know, if you can't do it, if you have a hang up, believe me, your competitor may take advantage of that. No question about so, it. So now, what happened? It, this, this guy and I, he was, he was the president of the division, and we were walking through the casino, just going over some stuff about, Maybe the layout of the casino could change, make it easy. And all of a sudden, this this couple from Atlanta, they said, oh my God, it's one of the twins. And they came <laughs> right up to me, they wanted to meet me, shake my hand and everything. And I was, you know, it made me feel good. It really yeah, right, did. Right. And I was so happy, I was just happy to see them as they were me. Oh my God, you're so down to earth. And I said, well, thank you, so are you. And she said, can we take a picture with you? I said, well, of course. And so we took a picture. So after that, so hold it, hold it. But the picture was taken. Who did you hand the camera to? I handed it to, <laughs> to, to, to my, your colleague. Right? Right. Right. Would right. you mind taking this picture? You know, and he couldn't say no. No, he couldn't. Was, he, he but was they caught. weren't interested in him being in the picture. You no. know, there's a time and place right, for right, everything, right. which I don't think he understood anyway. Right, right. It's not that kind of guy. Right. No. So I had him in the camera and said, would you mind taking this picture? So he took the picture and he said, gee, uh, Dan, uh, you mean tell me that many people read the magazine? I said, oh, this is a worldwide magazine. They read this magazine on every continent on the face of the globe. So he just couldn't believe it. And it really made him upset. Well, I got another story that might be a little better than that. I said, you know, we have before you bring yes. that story up yes. i want our audience to understand that that when you have this type of bias yes uh it, it, and it's been ingrained and there's something that it's hard to change right those individuals that embrace that right. they they're threatened yes by the success of an african american uh, or, or they they make excuses and say well you were hired as uh, you know as a quota and all of, right. all of these nasty things that are are being said by accomplished people like yourself uh, that that has to deal with that type of ignorance and that type of indoctrination. They those individuals try to reinforce whether it's through ethnic jokes, whether it's through. Uh, uh, Making a comment, ah, uh, well, that magazine is not that important. I've never read it, you know, sure, certainly. you know that sort of thing. A put down instead of saying, "Hey, you know, that was a great thing, Dan, that that the people recognize you." But it had to go the other way yes. because if it didn't go the other way, that would have made them feel uncomfortable, as 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 some people do. No question uh, about it. And it was it was an underhanded compliment, you right? Know? And, and uh, a lot of times, uh, 
I, I have to ignore ignorance sometimes, but but with the with ignorance carries a heavy weight, and when it's constantly thrown your way, it becomes a burden to deal with mm -hmm. because in every, you're carrying this load of ignorance with you, and and really, uh, you have to be real really strong. You have to you, you have, have to be, be to to maintain your professionalism. That's right. Because the the the. There is a reason why that's done. Yes. It's to it's to make you embrace that stereotype that they've been indoctrinating for years of saying they're angry, they're angry. Yes. Well, you know, you know, after 400 years, some people can get angry, but the us that are professionals, we understand and recognize what it is and we navigate. Well, in reference to that, I was in the marketing meeting with Terry and I said, Terry, let's talk about global marketing. Okay, Dan. I said, you know, we have a vice president of, market, of European marketing. I said, we have a vice president of Middle Eastern marketing, marketing, which you worked in the gaming industry. I think you know where I'm going yes, with it. Yes. I said, you have a vice president of Latin American marketing, and you have a vice president of Asian marketing. I said, but you don't have a vice president of African marketing. Terry says, well, then they have casinos in, they already have casinos in South Africa. I said, Terry, Africa is a continent, not a country. He said, you know what, Dan? You're the first person to ever tell me something like this. I never thought of it. Now, here's a chairman of MGM Marketing. Now, he doesn't realize that these are developed countries. The country of Kenya makes hundreds of billions of dollars off of safaris. Nigeria is one of, has one of the largest oil reserves in the world. Hakeem Elijah, one of the basketball players, his father is, they're from Nigeria. He's one of the largest construction magnets in the world. He sent all his kids to Oxford and Cambridge. Most people don't know that. Hakeem is the least educated one of the bunch. Out of all his kids. Let me just add a caveat to Egypt. that. Egypt. Some people, not all, right. some people don't want to know that. That's exactly they right. They want to suppress that. That's right. They want to keep it, uh, uh, you know, right. at, at, at a level where they feel comfortable. Right. This continent has more raw materials than any continent on the face of the earth. Diamonds, you know. They've all been they've been stolen from and manipulated, but they have billionaires everywhere. And I, I sat Terry down and I told him these things and I said, Terry, people gamble all over the world to ignore an entire continent. A potential robust market. Right. Uh -huh. An entire continent of people with a multitude of countries to just not even market to them. I said, the MGM can be the company for those African countries to visit here. Not Caesar's Palace, not the Wynn, but the MGM, because people never forget the ones that embrace them. He said, Dan, we've got to do something about this. You know, but unfortunately, he developed cancer and passed away mm. before we could ever make that materialize. Mm -hmm. But that was another idea that I brought to the table. But that is what I'm talking about, the lack of diversity at the top. Do you regret retiring before that came to fruition? or No, it was time, Lonnie. Yes. It, it was really time time, time for me to, to, to go by. Well, it, it had been a long struggle. The, the, it was a fight all the way. It, don't get me wrong. There were wonderful moments, and we've talked about them. And the positive certainly outweighed the negative. I have to give thanks for coming to Las Vegas, you know, uh, all the wonderful times I've had, all the accomplishments that I've made, all of the dear friends like yourself that I have made. They've enhanced my life more than I could ever dream of. I've traveled the world because of Las Vegas. But the, the weight and the burden of always being the first, I was either the first or the only and almost every job I ever had. And 
I don't think people really, they they see all the glamour, but I don't think they really understand the work that it that it took. And uh, I think I'm relatively healthy to this day. You know, how about the tolerance that it took? It took a lot of tolerance. You know, uh, it's probably why I don't have any tolerance today <laughs> because I've had so I. I've, you have tolerance with like, your great kids. Yeah, right. I, oh, that's, that's about it. That's about it. Right, right. <laughs> but the, the tolerance that I had to sustain over all of those years, you know, being called boy, being called the N-word, you know, I, I did get called the N-word at work. You mentioned to me off camera that when we were talking about this podcast, yeah. that there was a person at the beginning of your career yeah that would call you every day every and day. use the N-word. Yes, every time I'd answer the phone, he would call me the N-word and slam the phone down. Every time if I answered, I, 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 I could, this is how it impacted me. I can remember the extension, 7423 and 7424. Those were my extensions. He would call 7423 because at that time I was an assistant hotel manager and there were two managers. And our shifts kind of overlapped each other. And he didn't, he would never want to talk to me, associate with me, or have anything to do. And when I would answer the phone, Dan Napier, man, I help you, you fucking slam the phone down. Excuse my language. Yeah, no, no. On no, the no, show. No, and no that, I that's emphasis. For that. That, that's not true. Right. Emphasis. You're emphasizing it's, what happened. And uh, he did that every day. And I remember uh, telling my supervisors about it. And during the early 70s, we we didn't have the human resources department say we have now. You know what they told me, Dan? You're being a little too sensitive. You kind of gotta let that stuff slide off your shoulders. Just ignore it. In today's society, I might have had a couple of million dollars in the bank. You mm -hmm. know, you understand. Mm -hmm. But back in those days, if uh, as an African American, and, and those were all of us that worked in the industry, if we tried to file a complaint like that. Uh, it would be swept under the table. Mm -hmm. The casinos, really, no lawyer would defend you. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was hard to find attorneys. But, that would. but for the grace of God, we've had individuals like yes. a Terry Lanny. And, yes, and people that understood that that money uh, or being successful in the hospitality industry, it's it's all about change. Yes, I is. mean, I with the old the the baby boomers. You know, we you know sure. we're. Uh, we're spending our money on health issues. Yes, right. <laughs> Not on going out to eat or party or anything else. Right. And now the millennials. And then you have the other generations that are coming in that don't have that same type of um, attitude or hang-ups about race or, or trying to yes. to uh, uh, continue uh, this type of uh, behavior. Now, I said some. Right then there's others that, that embrace it because, you know, if you can have those type of privileges where where you can benefit not on, on uh, the content of your character, but just on the color of your skin, then, you know, uh, some people will take that low-hanging fruit. No question and, and, about and, it. And, and embrace that. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but it's refreshing to see the changes that the town has made. Absolutely. And, and to this day, I, I, I would like to... Uh, find seek and find out if these casinos do have uh, marketing divisions devoted to the continent of Africa. Wow. I, I I would think they don't. I mean, I've never heard of it. I'll do my but research. Please do, <laughs> Dr. Yeah, Wright. I'll do my research. But I, I tell you, uh, it is the, the, the evolution of Las Vegas in that regard is getting better. We, yes. uh, I think my partner told me, uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, Harold Lewis told me that an African, uh, no, no, a Native American company bought the Palms Hotel. A Native American company bought uh, the Hard Rock Hotel. Right. And and so people are starting to understand that these these thoughts and stereotypes and and uh, oppression and suppression of people of color, uh, their ability. To embrace hospitality sure. is 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 good, if not better, right. because how how tolerant, how serving can you be, being uh, and treating people the way you want to be treating treated, 
Right. As as a descendant of slaves, no question. You know, because they 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 had to tolerate a whole lot of stuff with a smile. Oh, no question. <laughs> with about a smile. That. So so we've always been hospitable, right? When we weren't receiving any hospitality. No, you no, know. unfortunately. But I tell you, Vegas is getting better. Yes. I also want you to uh, to 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 share about the transportation. I think we drove the city before this interview, and I told you about uh, Elon Musk, right. about what he's doing, that underground, which I think is very, in my humble opinion, is a very smart thing to do, uh, uh, to, to have his boring company to come in and to have underground traffic. What do you think about that? I think it's an excellent idea. I can remember when people were talking about putting a monorail down the down the center of the strip, I and and uh, I think that would have uh, taken away from the beauty of the strip. Uh, I think underground would ease the traffic issues that 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 we face now because Las Vegas, as I see it today, is extremely congested, and you've got you you have people on top of each other, and when, when the town was younger. It was uh, there was more room for people to spread out and leisurely go from place to place. You see what I mean? And and I've always felt that when the closer in people get to one another, the more crime, the more frustrations that they face. Parking is an ordeal. It's not a convenience anymore. Does it take away from the hospitality It takes experience? away from the hospitality experience, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the parking, are, the, the fees are en enormous. If the I infrastructure, think. if the infrastructure does not match or uh, the superstructure, you, you have 17 of the largest hotels in the world. Right. And let's just say hypothetically, we have a two lane highway coming from Southern California to uh, Las Vegas. That yeah. doesn't match, man. No, it makes the, it's not sustainable. The drive should be a drive of convenience and excitement. Right. People should be excited on their way here, and because most of them leaving sad when they leave. <laughs> <laughs> not all <laughs> the time. Not all the time. <laughs> but because it's changing from being a gambling center to an entertainment That's center. That's exactly right. But oh, sports and entertainment. And sports and entertainment. Let's add that part. You're right. Yes. And I think that. People getting here and going from casino to casino should be the most convenient thing about the city. That's what everybody should be raving about. Oh, it's so easy to go here. Oh, it's so easy to go there. We went to five casinos in one night. Now it's so congested that, that and I don't know if that's cause and effect, if, if that's a marketing tool that casinos want you to use to have a captive audience. But I think that when you're able to go from casino to casino, you get more business and you get a more free and giving place, you know. But again, parking has no overhead. <laughs> it's strictly profit. So I get why they're charging it. And 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 I want to thank you for, for coming to our, our podcast. I know you have a flight to take. Yes, I do. And I, I don't want you to miss your flight. Can't. But but I tell you what, it uh can we do this again? I'd love to do it again. Next, I would love to do next it. Next time you're in town, we would really love to have you because I want our audience to really appreciate Las Vegas hospitality evolution. It starts with people. It starts with ideas. It starts with the changing of the guard from uh, baby boomers to millennials from the great generation before the baby boomers. Right. Uh, uh, to 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 where we are now, we're we're looking at different type of entertainment, right. a different type of entertainment. Let me ask you this last question. Yes, if you were still in your position, this is hypothetical. I'm putting okay. you on the spot now. Right. You know, Vegas at one time had our Rat Pack. Yeah. And now with this new generation of young people, and and it transcends the color of your skin. This thing called hip hop. Uh, uh, that has permeated all over the world and into all cultures, who would you say would be the Rat Pack 
of 2023. <laughs> I know I told you that. Well, you know. that's okay. I, th- I think I, I can answer. I think it was the crew that performed at the Super Bowl. Wow, that's a great answer. You know, and, I, and, and, and you can't it, have it without Snoop Dogg. You can't yeah, have it Snoop Dogg is something right. else. All right, you've got Dr. Dre, uh, Mary J. Blige, Eminem. Uh, you got to add Beyonce in there. Beyonce has to be in there. Maybe yes. Taylor Swift. Maybe. Yes. She can rock yes, and roll. She absolutely. can rock it. Absolutely. So uh, he, he would. I see it, it, this particular Rat Pack would have males and females. Exactly. You know. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Right. Because all the the headlines, well, there was one he, uh, one uh, person on the marquee that th- had the one name basis, and that was Diana. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> remember with Diana? I, I remember. She, but the, the, Diana, and then you, you, you know, of course, you would have the chairman of the board. Right. Uh, of course, Frank, Frank. You know, and then Sammy, Sammy. just first name basis. Right. You know who, it, right. who they are. But right. now Vegas is a, a, a international city yes, in our is. entertainment uh, uh, for to, to, to bring all of us together, the domestic and the international, mm-hmm. is kind of like visual with the Cirque shows. No question. Everybody about. understands when an elephant disappears right. all over the world. Oh, yeah. And that's why boxing was such a great draw because everybody understands two people beating each other up. You know, I, I, I told that story with Mike when I was telling him, you know, we got you cheap. I said, Mike, you know, if you, if you go to a soccer game, most people don't know how long the soccer game lasts. They don't know the rules. I said, if if you live in Europe and you go to a, an American football game, you really don't know the rules. I said, you. I said, but when you go to a boxing match, everybody from two to ninety-two know the rules. Knows what a butt whooping is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and guess what? From from two. To, to, to 42 or whatever, 82. All right. Uh, uh, some of them have received a button. That's exactly. Well, well uh, from 92 uh, too. <laughs> Mr. Napier, Dan, Not my right. good friend, thank you so much for spending some time. And I'm going to hold you to coming back and, 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 and because we have a lot to talk this about. This is a thrill for me. Thank you so well, much for acknowledging my career. And my efforts, and, and I want to thank everybody involved, from the technicians, Mr. Lewis, everybody for, for having me out here. I have really enjoyed it, and it's great to be back home. Thank you, thank you so you much. Having. And if you enjoyed what you heard here, please uh, hit like and subscribe to Las, uh, Las Vegas Hospitality Evolution. You'll be surprised what you're going to learn here from an academic point of view. Thank you so much. Thank you.